and happy All Saints Day. We celebrate uh, all those who born witness before us, and we give thanks for one particular person today who is uh, John the Baptist. So let us pray. Gracious God, for the gifts of this day and the beauty of this autumn season, we are grateful. We are grateful for this time together. May it enliven our faith and deepen our love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, this morning, let's think a little bit about John the Baptist. We have now come to the end of our discussion of Old Testament prophets and kings, and now we begin a new section on New Testament prophets and their relationships to kings. And of course, we have to start with John the Baptist and Herod Antipas. What a story. Now, some of you may have read James Thurber's uh, short stories in which one of them is called The Get Ready Man. And The Get Ready Man goes all across town with a megaphone telling everybody, get ready, get ready, judgment's coming. And I love that story. And this past week, I read a wonderful book by Catherine Murphy entitled John the Baptist, Prophet of Purity for a New Age. And she has this wonderful image of John the Baptist. She says, John the Baptist is like a champagne bottle that's shattered against the hull of a new ship that's being launched. So imagine John the Baptist as a champagne bottle launching this brand new ship. Jesus will say of John the Baptist, all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you can accept it, that man is Elijah, the one who is to come. So Jesus sees John as sort of the hinge between the days of yore and the new age. He is the, the hinge between BC and AD. He is the one who gets the ball rolling for this coming kingdom of God. It is the dawn of a new age, and John announces it. Now, in Murphy's book, she points out that John shows up all over the Gospels and even into the book of Acts. There are 15 different sort of vignettes about John the Baptist in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there are about four distinct vignettes in the Gospel of John, and there are about seven of them in the book of Acts. So the longest vignette happens in Luke 1 and 2, where it's the birth narratives of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And these two are connected from the very beginning, from their conception to their deaths. They are linked together in Luke's mind, sort of like cousins. And the conception of John the Baptist is unusual because it's two older parents who have a child late in age. And of course, the conception of Jesus is quite unusual, a virgin birth. And both are seen as folks who will do great things. If you read the angel's prophecy to Zechariah about what this child will be like, he says this, he will go ahead of the Lord strong and mighty, like the prophet Elijah. He will get the Lord's people ready. And Zechariah, once he gets his language back, his tongue back, he will say of his son, you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go ahead of the Lord and prepare his way for him. Then Jesus is said great things about him as well, that he will be the son of the most high, etc., and that he will set his people free. We know about that. Now, because of this mutual greatness, some perceived a kind of rivalry between them, two great figures as though they were in uh, conflict with one another. But in fact, they're seen as collaborating together in the announcing of this coming kingdom of God. Uh, John the Baptist will say in John 3 about Jesus, uh, I must decrease, but he must increase. In the synoptics, John will say of Jesus, I'm not even fit to untie his sandals. So in all these cases, John the Baptist defers to Jesus, who he knows is, in fact, the coming one. Now, it's important to remember that the followers of John the Baptist and the followers of Jesus 
often felt in tension with one another. And you get these stories that sort of highlight that. In John 1, it's interesting because Peter and his brother Andrew are depicted as first being disciples of John the Baptist, and then they move over to following Jesus. When John says of Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. In Matthew 2, there's a debate between Jesus' disciples and John's disciples about fasting. And Jesus' disciples don't fast, and John's disciples do. In Matthew 11, there's this observation that John's disciples do not drink wine because John had been sort of a Nazarite from birth, giving up any kind of wine. But Jesus and his disciples, every time you look around, they're at somebody's house drinking wine. And so they're seen as sort of wine bibbers, etc. Then John the Baptist, according to John 10, does no miracles. But Jesus points to his miracles as a sign of the coming kingdom of God. Then it's most interesting in Acts 18 and 19 because there seem to be some ongoing followers of John who are out in the Mediterranean era and they see John the Baptist as the one who was to come. And so we get this story of Apollos, who's a great preacher, but he's got it kind of got screwed up about what the meaning of, of John's baptism is. So this married couple, Priscilla and Achilla, pull him aside and sort of get the preacher right. And boy, do we ever need that, Matthew, sometimes. So at this point, 19, Paul goes into Ephesus, and there's some disciples of John the Baptist that know nothing about the baptism of Jesus, which promises the gift of the Spirit. And Paul has to instruct them, and they are baptized into Christ. So the ongoing nature of this rivalry is depicted in Acts. Now, you may also wonder if there was a rivalry between John the Baptist and the Essene community at the Dead Sea uh, community of Qumran. Uh, some have wondered if John the Baptist came out of that community and then sort of turned against it. Now, uh, I went to Qumran a couple of years ago, and the Israeli uh, tourism industry has figured out their audience really well. They know that most of the people who come to sites like that are Christian tourists from the United States. So they show this video at Qumran now before you go through the site, which tells you, of course, that John the Baptist uh, got all of his instructions uh, for how to be a prophet from the Qumran community. Uh, let's just say there's some uh, historical questions about that. Now, they're both in the wilderness, and they're both anticipating this uh, fire and brimstone that's coming, but there are some, some real differences. Now, the thing that makes them most alike is they're both interested in Israel's purity and holiness, that Israel needs to return to that kind of bedrock holiness. But what makes them different is this. Uh, if you go to Qumran, the baptisms that they were doing were ba basically daily ritual baths that they would ex experience before they would eat a meal together. So you can actually go down the steps where you walk in and have this ritual purity, then you can go and eat together. So John's baptism was different. It was a once off, you know, preparation for the coming kingdom. Also, the audience that the Dead Sea community wanted to uh, attract were sort of Jewish separatists that wanted to get away from the impurity of Jerusalem and live in holiness, etc. John, on the other hand, is calling everybody down to the Jordan to repent. All of Israel is called to his uh, new repentance. And But most importantly, the Essenes really had one primary goal, and that was to throw the priests out of the temple so they could become the new priesthood in Jerusalem. John the Baptist doesn't seem to care a whit about the temple. He doesn't say a thing about the temple. The temple's not his goal. His goal is this preparation for this coming one who's going to be the dawn of the kingdom. So if you look at uh, John's preaching, let's think about what he actually said. 
basically here is his sermon in a nutshell. And some people, you know, can get pigeonholed into sermons. John the Baptist can be easily pigeonholed into he's a Johnny one note. And here it is. The kingdom of uh, God is at hand. So repent of your sins, be converted, be baptized and ready yourself for this coming one who is going to bring us the kingdom of God. Uh, that is his message. Now, in terms of what he saw coming, he saw a fire and brimstone on the horizon. Think of what he said. He said, look, the coming one is going to lay the ax to the roots. He's going to fell all these trees, and there's going to be a sifting of the wheat and the shaft, and the shaft is going to be burned with an eternal fire. In other words, John sees hell coming on the horizon. It is going to be tough. And what's interesting about John's portrait in the Gospels is this. Matthew and Mark both picture John baptizing Jesus, but Luke and John never explicitly say, John baptized Jesus. There's some ambiguity there, and I'll leave it with you at that. Now, when John is captured by Herod Antipas, one of the things that happens to him in prison is he sends some messengers to say to Jesus, are you, are you really the one to come, or should we wait for another? Now, one of the reasons that question is asked is this. John's expecting what? Fire, brimstone, axes, uh, sifting of wheat. We're talking about a, a tremendous judgment of God. And what does Jesus give him? Well, let's see. The blind see, the lame walk, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed are those who are not offended by this. So one of the questions we need to ask is, did John really completely understand who this coming one was and what he would do? It's a very interesting question. Okay, let's get to the heart of this. The ethical preaching of John, meaning that is after you announce the coming of the kingdom of God, wh what does this mean to us? Here's the ethical preaching of John. He says, bear fruit, that befits repentance. And also every tree that does not bear good fruit, oh, well, of course, it's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's his message. And three groups, uh, particularly in Luke 3, are addressed in terms of what are the ethical implications of this coming kingdom. The first group are those who are prosperous, who have enough food and clothing to share with other people. The second group are the tax collectors, and Jesus says to them, don't collect more taxes than are due to you. And the third group is a little ambiguous. These are the soldiers, the soldiers. Now, we don't know exactly which soldiers they are. Do they belong to Herod? Are they temple soldiers? Are they Roman soldiers? Or maybe they're zealots. Most scholars tend to think that maybe most likely, these are zealot soldiers who would go out and confiscate property of Jewish collaborators and things of that sort. So what does he say to them? He says, don't take money by force and don't falsely accuse someone and be content with your wages. So, so John is speaking specifically to the ethical implications of the coming kingdom of God. And there's a fourth group that's a little more difficult, that raises a lot of problems for John. And who's the fourth group? Well, it happens to be King Herod Antipas. Now, here's an example, Matthew, where ethics can start getting you in trouble in preaching. This is where it's meddling. John the Baptist is going to be meddling. Now, let's think about Herod Antipas. He's one of the multiple children of Herod the Great's 10, count them, 10 wives. Now, he, he did dispose of some of his wives and children, but Herod Antipas survived that. Now, this is an incredibly screwed up family. Uh, 
Herod Antipas ends up being what is called the Tetrarch of Galilee. That means he's not really a king. He's more like a exalted governor or this thing. Now, one of the things that will uh, that is not told in the New Testament, but we know it from Josephus, is this. Uh, after their dad died, Herod the Great died, uh, the brothers, Herod Antipas and Archelaus went to Rome to vie for their father's estate and his title. And there they meet with the emperor Augustus. And Augustus was very, very clever. And what he ended up doing is dividing up Herod the Great's kingdom to the three sort of half brothers, uh, Archelaus and Herod, Herod Antipas and Philip. And uh, what you also might need to know is that Archelaus showed himself very quickly to be, to be incompetent. So he is called back to Rome. And guess what uh, Augustine does to Archelaus? He exiles him to Gaul, present day France. Now, remember that because we have some more of that coming in a moment. All right. So this is a screwed up family. And also it's screwed up about their marriages. So there's some confusion about names of wives and daughters. And part of the confusion goes like this. Who is Herodias and who is Salome? Now, uh, I don't want to get too uh, thick into the weeds of this screwed up family heritage. But just, just to let you know, Mark 6 and, and Matthew 14, there is a difference as to whom Herod Antipas was married to to whom he was married, okay? Now, again, you can take your choice. One will say he's married to Herodias, and one says he's married to Salome. But let's, let's let that just ride, because these wannabe kings were so screwed up, that it doesn't quite really matter. Well, here's what happens. Uh, before he's married to whoever it was, Herodias or Salome, Herod Antipas is married to the daughter of the king of Nabatea, which is present day Jordan. And this woman is never named. But it turns out that Antipas decides to divorce her because he's in love with either, take your choice, Herodias or Salome. And he marries her. And oh, by the way, uh, who she was married to is often disputed too, whether it was the brother Philip or another half-brother, Herod II, but who cares? It, so it's this irregular marriage uh, that John the Baptist denounces because it was against the Mosaic law that you would marry someone who's been married to your brother and that sort of thing. So in Luke 3, we get the story that John, that, that John is imprisoned by Antipas because of this public denunciation of his illicit marriage. And it's interesting because in Mark 6, after he's imprisoned, uh, Herod Antipas wants to call John the Baptist in to listen to him because, quote, he listens to him gladly. Now, again, such a weird attraction to someone who's denounced you publicly for your immoral marriage. Now, those of you who remember in Luke 23, Jesus is hauled in front of this same Herod Antipas, and this same Herod Antipas had longed to hear Jesus, and more importantly, wanted to see Jesus do one of his miracles for him. And Jesus won't say a thing to him and won't do any miracle tricks for him. He absolutely stones him because why? Well, he cut the head off of my cousin, you know. Now, Josephus gives you a different reason for why John was imprisoned. This is from uh, uh, the Antiquities, the, the, the 18th book. And here is, here is Josephus' reason for imprisoning, uh, uh, Josephus' reason for Herod in, in, in imprisoning John. He says this, for Herod killed Jesus, although he was a good man and urged the Jews to practice virtue. Uh, doing uh, In this way, it seemed to him that the baptism would be acceptable 
for the people of the Jews. And when the other peoples gathered to hear him, Herod became alarmed that John's powerful ability to persuade people might come cause some sort of revolt. Uh, for they seemed likely to do anything John counseled them. So it would be much better to take the lead after he sparked a revolt than to wait until a charge occurred and regret it if he was engulfed in the circumstances. So at least in, in Josephus' mind, um, John is in prison because John might spark an actual revolt. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So at the end of this uh, weird story, eventually you'll have this drunken uh, drinking party where Herod promises stuff to his uh, lovely daughter, whoever she is, Salome or Herodias. And he's uh, told by her that she wants to have John's head on a platter. And it's really interesting the way Mark 6 depicts it. He says, oh, he just felt so badly about doing this. He just regretted it so much that he had to cut off John's head. Remember, he liked to go hear, hear John, okay? Well, he does kill him. Now, what's very interesting about this story of this drunken party and dancing, all that, is that only Matthew and Mark tell this story. Apparently, Luke and John uh, realize that maybe there's some historical difficulties about how this all transpired. So they don't even relate that story. Uh, but here are two bad results for Herod Antipas as a result of killing John the Baptist. Here's the first one. Herod Antipas starts thinking that Jesus is Her uh, John the Baptist come back from the dead. A lovely Halloween story. He thinks that John the Baptist has resurrected himself into Jesus. Oh my. And the second result is this. Remember that Nabataean uh, king's daughter? Well, guess what? That Nabataean king, uh, Aretas, did not take kindly to his daughter being divorced. So guess what he did? He launched a military assault against Herod Antipas. And guess what? Herod Antipas's entire army is wiped out. Now, uh, Josephus also knows about this. And this is what Josephus said about that military defeat. But to some of the Jews, it seemed that Herod's army had been destroyed by divine vengeance and quite justly as a punishment for John, who is called the Baptist. So there you have it. Antipas' army is wiped out. He thinks that Jesus is John the Baptist raised from the dead. So this is all very bad. Now, not, not long after that, uh, Herod Antipas builds a new city on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. It's, and he names it Tiberias after the emperor Tiberius. The only problem about this new city is the following. It's built on a graveyard. And so no Jews will move there. So it becomes a completely Gentile city. Do you, do you ever recall Jesus going to Tiberias in the gospels? No. He goes to towns north of that on the Sea of Galilee, but never to Tiberias. Well, lo and behold, then the emperor Tiberius dies. And so Antipas's wife, whether it's Herodias or Salome, you know the story, uh, urges him to go to Rome so that he might get more territory and a better title from this new emperor named, oh my goodness, Caligula. So they go to Rome, and, and who else goes at the same time? Well, it's yet another half-brother named Herod Agrippa, who shows up later in the book of Acts. And he goes to Rome on a separate ship. They meet in Rome. They come before this new crazy emperor named Caligula. They argue their case, and guess what? Agrippa has a better case than does Antipas. Oh, and guess what happens? The emperor Caligula exiles him to 
Yes, you guessed it. The Roman Siberia, Gaul. And he's now in Gaul. Oh, guess what? Guess who else was uh, exiled there after Archelaus and Antipas? That would be Pontius Pilate. So imagine them having a little tete-a-tete -tete later on. Now, what are the effects of John's death on Jesus himself? Well, it's very obvious that he sees John like himself as, as a reed that's not shaken in the wind. That is, he's not frightened by these uh, threats by the king. He, he's, he's not someone who's clothed in soft garments. Uh, Jesus will, uh, he will see himself in exactly that same way. But you will recall in Luke 13 that uh, after all these events, this is an event that I, I want to read because it, it's so interesting. This is Luke 13, 31. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, you must get out of here, get out of Galilee and go somewhere else because Herod, Herod Antipas wants to kill you. And Jesus answered them, go and tell that fox. I am driving out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I shall finish my work. Yet I must be on my way today, tomorrow and the next day. It is not right for a prophet to be killed anywhere except in Jerusalem. And then he does the lament over Jerusalem, 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 killing the prophets, etc. So here's the point. Jesus sees that what happened to John the Baptist will happen to him, but it will happen in Jerusalem. So what's the big takeaway of this long John the Baptist story? And it is a lot of material, and I haven't covered uh, really more than probably about a half of it. Well, I would think that there are three takeaways from the John the Baptist and the Herod uh, Antipas story. First of all, we are called to speak the truth to power, regardless of the threats. Uh, in Presbyterian church history, one of the most uh, memorable examples of this, uh, and if you uh, were to go on to Google and Google the name John Knox, you would remember a, a, a Presbyterian firebrand who had been to Geneva and came back to Scotland and decided that there should be a Protestant Reformation in Scotland. And he ends up, having these very tense confrontations with Queen Mary of Scots. And she is not thrilled by John Knox. And it's a long story, but I, I recommend that you click on John Knox and Mary Queen of Scots. It is a great experience of seeing someone speak the truth to power, or at least the way they saw it. And I would say that that's part of our role is the church. A second thing is ethics matter. It's one thing to talk about theory, you know, the God who's coming, the kingdom of God who's coming, et cetera. It's another thing to talk about practice and, and praxis and what this demands from our lives. John the Baptist keeps on saying to every group, including the king, bear fruit that befits repentance. It's not enough to say, Lord, Lord, it, it also is incumbent upon our lives to be transformed. And the third thing is this. There's that saying that says the arc of the universe bends towards justice. I've been reading a great deal of Reinhold Niebuhr and we'll be doing my last lecture on him tomorrow at the Oasis. And, and Niebuhr's biggest question is, is the God of justice still sovereign over a screwed up world? And he keeps saying there, there are signs of it, there are hints of it. And when things happen, you have to say, is God's justice being worked out in this situation? As you know, the biggest question in the Psalms is this, uh, why do the evil prosper? Why does justice not rain down like mighty rivers? And the Psalmists keep reminding themselves, uh, wait on the Lord, things will work out. So I think that one of the big questions in the John the Baptist story is this, can injustice ultimately stand? 
And I think the way that the Herod Antipas story ends with him exiled into Gaul might give us pause. My goodness, is that possible? And I wonder if Pontius Pilate and Antipas ever got together and had a little chat about these strange characters they encountered, this John the Baptist and this, and this Jesus. Wouldn't that have been an interesting conversation to have? Do they ever think to themselves, hmm, is the judgment of God working itself out in our own lives? I wonder. So here's, here's the takeaway. Speak the truth and power. Ethics matter. And trust that the ark of justice will ultimately succeed. And the ark of justice will bend toward the future. And that's the good news. So that's the John the Baptist story. My goodness. Um, there, there's so many other things we could say about him, but that's really what I want to focus on was uh, John the Baptist and his relationship with Herod Antipas. So your thoughts, your comments on this uh, All Saints Day.